Good morning, church, and happy Lord's Day. Well, it's a good Sunday, and it's next going to be even better next week, because next week many of us will be able to gather together again for the first time as we try to course correct and begin to slowly, decently, and in order get back to the way we're used to things being and services in full swing. And we'll start slow and incrementally and purposefully and cautiously and then proceed that direction in a safe manner as the Lord leads. You'll find the text this morning in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. 2 Thess Thessalonians chapter number 2 there in your Bibles at home. And when you found your place there, look down in verse number 6. And the text this morning will be verses 6 through 12. And we'll try to cover these verses and we'll try to dig in just a little bit and try to get what God has for us. And very important topic, subject this morning, if you will, uh, in this message. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I'll begin reading in your hearing in verse number 6. Please follow along there in your Bibles at home and see what God has to say. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse number 6. This is the word of God. And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, so much for the opportunity uh, to glean from the Word of God, to have it, to study it, to hear preaching from it, and to preach from it. And Lord, we pray that the Spirit of God would so have His way in our hearts through the preaching of this message. Oh God, that we would be fed, that we would be nourished, that we would be conformed more to the image of Jesus Christ. I pray uh, for illumination. I pray that you would illuminate my mind and loose my tongue. I pray, God, for spiritual awakening and enlightenment that our hearts would be stirred, O oh God, within us as we hear the Word of God preached. I pray, Lord, that you would help all those that need help this morning. And Lord, really, we all need the help of God. And help us, Lord, not only in, in a general way, but in a very specific way, because you know our needs. You know our thoughts are far off. You know our need before we ever speak them to you. Help us, O oh God, we cry to you because we know that you are a God that hears and answers prayer and you promise to answer it. You said, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Lord, help us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to preach this morning for these moments on this subject, the mystery of iniquity. The mystery of iniquity. Paul speaks here in our, in our text of the mystery of iniquity. And what is the mystery of iniquity? Really, it's that ongoing work of Satan that had its origin all the way back in the Garden of Eden. It was there that the serpent beguiled the woman through his subtlety. And it was there that sin entered into the world. And since that time, the mystery of iniquity has been at work. While every person has been given by God a free will, and what I mean by that is we can choose whom we will serve. And we see it in the book of Joshua and we see it throughout Scripture. Choose you this day whom ye will, and there's the word, serve. And so we've been given that, a free will by God, the ability to choose whom we will serve. Uh, and even though that's true, there are forces. There are spiritual forces outside natural human perception that are vying for our allegiance. There is, of course, the love of God on the one hand that pleads with men uh, that to be saved through Jesus Christ. And then on the other, uh, there's the lie of the devil that seeks to prevent man from being saved by appealing to his natural tendency towards sin. You have it, I have it. All people have a natural bent and a natural tendency towards sin. 
And, these are, and there are spiritual forces on the outside of us. There's God working in Christ through the Holy Spirit to draw us to the place of salvation in Jesus Christ. And there are the forces of evil, that satanic kingdom headed by Satan himself that are seeking to divert us and redirect our focus from God uh, to ourself and to sin that we have an in bred, inborn, natural tendency toward and bent toward. Some of the things that Paul reveals to us here concerning the mystery of iniquity here in our text are these. First, he reveals to us that it's already at work, and it has been at work, but it's already at work. Before we ever realize, and really uh, unbeknownst to much of the world, the mystery of iniquity is at work. Do we have a choice to make? Yes. Is the choice ours to make? Ultimately, yes. Are there factors, are there influencers on the outside that we are unaware of? Yes. I would say this, that a lot of times when we think we're in charge and in control and making the decision that we think we want to make, there are forces on the outside that we are unaware of that are influencing. And I'll use that word because they can't make us do anything, but oh, what a powerful influence they can be. And there are those. He says in verse number seven of this mystery of iniquity that it doth already work. Paul reveals that to us. Secondly, he reveals to us that it's restrained. Though it works, and it works hard, as hard really as it can, and it's already working and has been working really since the Garden of Eden and the entering of sin into the world, and death passed upon all men for that all have sinned, uh, it's restrained. It doesn't get to work at its full capacity. It's not working at full power. There is a limiter. There is a leash. There is a, a restraint on it and, and really a restrainer. He says, only he who now letteth will let. And before that, he says, and you know what withholdeth. You know what's holding it back. And so we see that it's already at work, Paul tells us. Number two, it's restrained. Number three, number three it will be unleashed. The, the thing restraining it, the thing withholding it, the thing, and the word is letting it, is going to be taken out of the way. Only he who now letteth will let until, the Bible says, until, verse 7, he be taken out of the way. And then, and then shall that wicked be revealed, which brings us, uh, to a pinnacle whenever it's unleashed, when this mystery of iniquity is fully unleashed, when it's completely open, when it's unchained, if you will, this world is going to see evil in a new way. It's going to see unrestrained evil. It's going to see uncurbed evil. It's going to see untempered wickedness like never before. And the man of sin is going to be here running everything. And then fourthly, Paul tells us, not only is it already at work, and not only is it restrained, and not only is it going to be unleashed, but here's the fourth thing, and Paul tells us this, and he tells us this really up front, and we'll see that more in a little bit, it's going to be destroyed. It's going to be destroyed. He says in verse number eight, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. And so he's going to be destroyed. Now, someone has outlined this portion of the, of, of the text this way. The present conflict, the prophetic climax, and the practical conclusion. And that really kind of grabs everything and holds it all together and pulls it all together in a neat form for us to understand and to hang our thoughts on. The present conflict, the prophetic climax, and the practical conclusion. Notice with me first, then, the present conflict. Paul says this in verses 6 and 7 of our text. And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. A, a mystery in Scripture is a truth that once was hidden, but is now revealed. And that's all it means. It's not yet been revealed, or now it's being revealed, but up to that point it had not been revealed. And there are many mysteries in Scripture, in the New Testament in particular. There are, there are several that just come to mind. What about, this one is the mystery of iniquity. Uh, Paul told Timothy about the mystery of godliness, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Wow, what a mystery, but it's been revealed to us. And then what about 
uh, the mystery in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Behold, I show you a mystery, Paul said. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. And we have that mystery, and there are other mysteries, and God is in the business of revealing mysteries to people to the end that He should be glorified and we should be saved by grace. Amen. The present conflict. And so He talks about this mystery of iniquity. And the revelation here is that there is an unseen conflict. Uh, a spiritual battle raging for the minds and for the hearts of humanity. The mystery of iniquity is described here as being at work. It means that it's actively working. It means that right now it's engaged. It's the same word used to describe the power of God's word in the life of one who receives it. Paul uses the same word back in 1 Thessalonians 2.13 where he said of the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Uh, the idea is that Satan and his kingdom are doing everything within their power to achieve his goal. Uh, Paul, but Paul notes that this mystery of iniquity that is at work is at the present time held back. It's withheld, it's let, it's restrained. He says, and now you know what withhold it, that he might be revealed in his time. And only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Uh, things are bad now. And you look around. And morality, and I think, uh, am I the only one? It's getting worse and worse. And used to things that were in the closet. And when I say worse and worse, I'm not talking about the presence of sin. I'm talking about the prevalence of sin. Uh, maybe the outwardness or the forwardness of sin. Because we know, and we used to use this phrase, you know, he's in the closet, he came out of the closet, you know, whatever it is. But the idea being that used to when people, there was a certain amount of shame in this country attached to sin. People had a conscience, and they still do, but boy, is that conscience seared. Is it uh, weakened, and is it watered down, and doesn't speak maybe as loud as it once did here in our country? But... Uh, they were in the closet, but now, and, and the presence of sin was always there. I mean, man, man has always been sinful, and never more sinful than at any other time. Here's the thing, though. It's more prevalent now. It's more in your face. They have parades promoting it, and so on and so forth. And people just do it right out in the open, billboards, and you see them, and you pass by in these places, and God help us in our country. Uh, there is something, uh, things are bad now. But the reason they aren't worse than they are, and they're bad, but they're not worse, and the reason they aren't worse than they are is because there's a restrainer. There's a restrainer. There's something preventing the devil from fully exercising his will. The presence of the restrainer is what prevents wickedness from completely taking over uh, on the one hand, and it's what holds off for now the outpouring of God's wrath on the other hand. Remember that the flood could not come until Noah was safely in the ark. Remember that fire couldn't rain down from heaven uh, on Sodom and Gomorrah until Lot was safely out of Sodom. Paul has already talked about a catching away, a gathering together away from here and unto Christ, a meeting of the Lord in the air. And once this happens, the restraints will be loosed and the way will be clear for the devil to have his way for a season on this planet. And my, oh my, he's going to uh, open the floodgates, the present conflict. It's the mystery of iniquity. It's already at work. It's going on. Uh, why don't people just come to Christ in droves? Part of it's the natural heart. Part of it is because there are forces standing in the way as best they can to block people from coming to Christ. And by the way, for the Christian, those forces don't give up. He said, Paul tells us in, in Ephesians chapter 6, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the mystery of iniquity is still working against the Christian, trying to keep us from reaching our full potential in Christ. We have potential in us because of, we have the Spirit of God in us. We have power in us because we have the Spirit of God in us. But I don't think this world has really seen what we are capable of through Christ Jesus and through the working of the Spirit of God and the outpouring of the Spirit of God because the mystery of iniquity is at work and it's trying to keep us from reaching our full potential in Christ Jesus. But greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And if we'll submit to God, uh, there'll be something else unleashed on this world and it'll be good. The present conflict, and now you know what withhold it that 
he might be revealed in his time, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The present conflict. Secondly, we see the prophetic climax. He goes on to say in verses 8 through 10, look at it with me. And then, verse 8, and then. Here's the chronology of it. Here's the timing of it. Here's the timeline, if you will. There is a restrainer in the world. Mystery of iniquity at work. Restrainer, withholding, letting, uh, not allowing is what it means. And then, what? Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed. It means unveiled. It means unleashed on the world. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose working is after Satan, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now there's a lot there and it's a mouthful, but let's break it down quickly. The first phrase, and then shall that wicked be revealed links us all the way back to verse 3 of this second chapter where Paul said this, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be, and here it is, revealed, the son of perdition. Uh, we see here first an unveiling, an unveiling. Paul uses the word revealed two times referring to the man of sin, the son of perdition, that wicked is what he calls him. Uh, one, uh, once the restrainer is removed, the curtain is going to be pulled back, the veil is going to be removed, and wickedness uh, personified is going to take control. It's going to take charge so far as this world is concerned. And so there is an unveiling, there is an unleashing, if you will. And then too we see uh, that this unveiling really gives way to an unleashing. Paul goes on to say in verses 9 and 10, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. This unleashing is twofold. First, there is the unleashing of the power of wickedness, the unleashing of this wicked, this evil power, the power of wickedness. Paul says that the coming of this wicked is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. The word working used here is the same word from which we get our word energy. It's, uh, the idea is that Satan is the one that energizes this wicked one. And we said last week, this is not Satan. But this is a pawn of Satan, a pawn of the devil. He's one that is energized uh, by Satan. He's working at the behest of the devil. Uh, this wicked, also called the man of sin and the son of perdition, and elsewhere the Antichrist, is not Satan. He's not the devil. He's one of the other two persons that make up the unholy trinity. This unholy trinity is made up of Satan, the beast, and the false prophet. Uh, he is, however, energized by Satan. He's empowered and enabled by Satan. And he is given special powers by Satan to perform signs. It means miracles. And to perform lying wonders. Uh, turn with me quickly in your Bibles there to Revelation chapter 13. And I just want to look at this quickly. And we won't spend a lot of time. Revelation chapter 13 verse number 12. Revelation 13, verse number 12 is where we'll begin reading and I'll just read down through verse number 15. He says this, And he exerciseth all power, all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, lying wonders, remember, so that he maketh fire to come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles we saw it signs miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a, by a sword and did live 
And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image, image of the beast should be killed. And so here you see the, the beast and you see uh, these other members and you see that he will use deception and trickery and lying wonders and miracles to deceive the world. And it's a great deception. And so it's an unleashing of the, uh, of the power of wickedness. Then too, we see that it's a, not, not only the unleashing of the power of wickedness, but it also involves the perishing of the wicked. This unleashing really ends in the perishing of the wicked. He says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. And again, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. The perishing of the wicked. Notice first, it's the perishing of the wicked one. That wicked is what he's called here. Paul says, and then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. And I love this. I love how the Holy Spirit treats us, and I love her the, how the Holy Spirit treats the text, and I love how he takes into consideration uh, his people, God's people. And here's what I mean by that. Paul no sooner mentions the great unveiling, the revelation of that wicked, than he immediately, uh, with the briefest of hesitations, only a small comma there in our text, he immediately records the sudden demise and certain destruction of that wicked. I once heard a preacher who said he liked to read mystery novels. And he said that he would read usually the first two chapters to get acquainted with the characters and kind of get an idea of the plot. And then he would skip ahead and read the last chapter because he wanted to know how the whole thing ended. And then once he knew how it ended, he would go back and read all of the other chapters and see how it all unfolded and watch it unfold as it happened. Well. That's kind of how the Holy Spirit does it here. Uh, that seems to be the style of the Holy Spirit of God. He doesn't wait until the end to tell us what happens in the end. <laughs> we don't have to wait in suspense to see how, thing, how this thing ends, right? We know. We know how it ends. Throughout Scripture, God is quick to tell us and to remind us that the evil loses and that the good prevails, that the devil is defeated, and that Christ, amen, is victorious, that the lost will ultimately be judged and condemned, and those saved by grace will inherit glory. And he tells us that from the very beginning. We could preach and study all that is contained within that little comma for a really long time. He says this in verse number 8, and you look at it in your Bible, and then shall that wicked be revealed, comma, Oh my, how much is condensed and squeezed and compacted into that comma. Um, we could spend a long time preaching about it, studying it, reading about it throughout Scripture. Uh, so much happens between the revealing of that wicked and the return of the Lord to consume and destroy him. That entire series is of message can be and have preached on it, uh, be preached on it. Volumes of books have been written compiling the multitude of things revealed in Scripture that happened between the revealing of that wicked and Christ's coming to destroy him. And yet, as though sensing the urgency and the need and, uh, and knowing the end from the beginning, the Holy Spirit moves Paul to, to squeeze it all into a tiny comma. And he gets straight to the point. He, he races, as it were, to the point. And then shall that wicked be revealed, comma, and you think, okay, now what's going to happen during this revelation? What all is going to happen? What's the world going to be going through? Where are we going to be when this happens? What are we going to be experiencing? And what, who's going to be here in the world? And what are they going to be experiencing? And we're thinking, okay, this is about to go. There's not enough. Thing. There's only one more chapter left. There's not enough in this book. And instead, the Holy Spirit says, okay, Paul, just put it all in that little bitty comma. And let's get to the point. Let's get to the climax, if you will. Let's skip ahead to the last chapter. And then shall that wicked be revealed, comma, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. And so as Paul speaks of the perishing of the wicked, he speaks first of the perishing of the wicked one. 
And he wants us to know, and really God wants us to know, how this thing ends. The, is there a road to travel? Yes. Is this world going to go through it? Oh, yes, they are. Uh, and all of this stuff is going to happen, but Paul just the, the Lord just tells Paul, you just put a little comma there, and we'll unfold all this stuff later on to them. Right now, I want them to know he's going to be revealed, and he's going to be destroyed. <laughs> and that's what I want him to know. It speaks of the, the perishing of the wicked one. Then, too, he speaks of the perishing of the wicked ones. And here's what I mean. He says in verse number 10, look at it with me. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. By this time, the whole world has been exposed to the gospel. The whole world has. Uh, there were the two witnesses, remember them, in Revelation chapter 11. And there were the 144,000 Jews, remember them, Jewish males, virgins, uh, spoken of in Revelation chapter 14. And then there was the angel. Do you remember the angel flying through heaven, having the everlasting gospel? Uh, look at it with me. Revelation chapter 14, just real quick. This might be a verse you want to mark in your Bible. Revelation chapter 14. The, the lengths that God goes through that they might be saved, that man might be saved, that Christ rejecting humanity might be born again and become a man, that enemies of God might be made friends of God and more than friends, family members of God. Look at it. Revelation chapter 14, verse number 6. Here's what John said. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of, of heaven, uh, of, the, of, of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. Look at him. Having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. You know, I've heard people say, if God's real, why doesn't he reveal himself? Honey, he has revealed himself. And why doesn't he just write it across the sky? He has the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. And why doesn't he just cause a voice to come out? He did it one time. This is my beloved son. Hear ye him. And, and on and on. But listen, during this time, God is going to pull out all the stops. Here he's going to have two witnesses. And wow, what mighty preachers they are. And miracles done. And then he's going to have 144,000 Jews preaching the gospel. And then he's going to have an angel as if all that weren't enough. He's going to have, this is the time of the wrath of God. And he's going to have an angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. What gospel is that? It's the everlasting one. It's the only one. It lasts forever. You don't need any other gospel. It's salvation by grace through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And he has the everlasting gospel. And not only does he have it, he's not concealing it. He said to preach to them that are on the earth. And just to make sure that he's not singling out individuals uh, on earth and that this is for everybody. He says every nation, every kindred, every tongue uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, all the people of the world are going to hear the gospel during this time. What time are we in? Well, we're already in the unveiling, in the, in the revelation of that wicked. That means we're gone out of here. That wicked has been revealed. We are in the time of the great tribulation of the outpouring of the wrath of God. We are in the time of Jacob's trouble in Daniel's 70th week. Uh, we are in the time of judgment. And what's happening? The gospel is still being preached. It's not removed. And not only that, God has almost turned it up some and angels flying through heaven preaching it. And still people will reject it. Oh, it's amazing to me. It's amazing to me. And the whole world by this time has heard the gospel. And many have been saved during this period. And we know that during this period people are going to get saved and so many of them and uh, but the multitudes who have adamantly rejected the gospel are completely without excuse because they've heard it they've heard an angel they've heard the 144 they've heard the two and they've heard others and they've seen the hand of God they've seen the wrath of God instead of bowing to him they cry they hide from hide us from the face of him who sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of His wrath has come. And instead of bowing to Him, submitting to Him, 
receiving that gift of eternal life from Him. They remain adamant in their rejection of God, in their rejection of Christ. And Paul refers to them using this phrase in verse 10 of our text, them that perish. That's what they become known as. Them that perish. Oh God, I was once one of them. Thank God I heard the gospel. Thank God I got saved. And you who have been saved, thank God you've been saved. And you that may be listening to this who don't know Jesus Christ, who have never been saved, accepting today, bow your knee willingly today. Them that perish is what they're known as. And the reason for this is simply stated, as Paul goes on to say, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. We've said it before, and I say it again, friend. The reason for everything, the reason behind everything that God has done since the fall of man in the Garden of Eden uh, may be summed up with the phrase at the end of verse number 10, that they might be saved. Why did God do this? And you read the Bible. Why is God doing it? Why is, why is all this happening? That they might be saved. That they might be saved. But this is that ultimate and final rejection of the gospel of Jesus Christ that can only end one way. Perishing. Perishing. It takes me back to Ezekiel 33 where the Lord said, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Has God proved that? Oh my, has he? We said it, the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Christ dying on the cross, Paul said he loved me and gave himself for me. Over and over, God has proved it. In, in big, general, broad stroke ways and in little bitty, tiny, specific ways in your life and mine. God has proved His love and has reached out to us. And in this day, He's still not done. Even in wrath, God remembers mercy. He sends those to preach the gospel. And He sends an angel. He says, you go preach the everlasting gospel. Fly through heaven and preach the everlasting gospel. Oh, friend, that's the heart of God. It's either salvation through Christ or it's judgment by Christ. This thing can't go on forever. It can't go on forever. Someone said there's a razor thin line between the, judge, the wrath of God and the mercy of God. And one day we're going to find out that that line is gone. There will be no more mercy. Wrath will be all that's left. Not because God ran out of mercy. His mercies are new every morning. But because man finally and ultimately and completely rejected that mercy. My spirit, God said, shall not always strive with man. The present conflict, the prophetic climax, it's coming, he's going to be unveiled. And finally, we see the practical conclusion. The practical conclusion, he says in verses 11 and 12, look at it with me. And for this cause, oh, doesn't this portion of scripture get some scrutiny out there? He said, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The practical con conclusion is the belief of a lie. It's of deception. Note that the word deception, that this deception is twofold. This deception is twofold. First, it's a willful deception. A willful deception. And that's really where the focus has to be. Paul says in verse number 11, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Uh, some may focus on the fact that God is sending them strong delusion and seek to, to find some sort of fault with that. Some sort of fault with God. It's God's fault. He sent the delusion. They believed a lie because God sent them a strong delusion. But just like the case with Pharaoh of old, the strong delusion has a root, it has a source, it, it has a cause, and it's not God. It's not God. You have to look at the text. Paul begins this verse by saying uh, of this God sent delusion and for this cause. Okay, we, before we focus on the God sent delusion, God shall send them delusion. Let's back up and let's pick this up. He said, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. What cause? 
Well, this takes us back to verse 10. And you've got to look at it in your Bible where Paul says this in verse number 10. He says, and with all this evilness of unrighteousness and them that perish. Here it is right here. Be cause. Here be the cause. Here's the cause. He says, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And then he says, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Before God ever sends strong delusion to believe a lie, he sends the truth. And he sends the truth. And he sends the truth. And friend, not only does he send the truth, much more than that, he sends the truth in love. He sends the truth in love. Every time God sends truth, it's wrapped up and bathed and saturated and soaked in the love of God. God sends the truth and he sends the truth and he sends it in love. And God's desire is to save. God's desire is always to save. But when the truth is rejected, when it's not received, a lie is all that's left. It's all that's left. What I'm saying is this. It's a willful delusion on their part because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. It's a willful delusion. Then too, and it's a willful deception. Then too, we see it's a woeful, a woeful deception. Paul concludes this section uh, that makes up our text for today by saying this, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. He said in the previous verse that they received not the truth. Here, he says that they had pleasure in unrighteousness. Here's the thing. Refusal to re receive the truth of the gospel is linked uh, with pleasure in sin. It's linked with it. Some refuse to accept Christ and to be saved because they love their sin. And they love their sin more than they love God. Uh, they refuse to walk with God because they are in love with this world. Here's, here's what John said. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And so it's either or. You can't have both. You can't have one foot in the world and one foot in the will of God. You can't, have, you can't have it both ways. And so many people either want it both ways or they just want it their way. And I'm that way and you're that way. Naturally, and thank God for, for not only the mystery of iniquity uh, that Paul talks about, but thank God for the mystery of godliness. Thank God that God pursues and that there's not just one force vying for me, there's another force. And every time the devil makes a bid for my soul, God reminds him of his claim on my soul. And greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. And greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. Christian, don't give up. Don't give up. Hold on. Trust God. Look up. Things are getting better. <laughs> They try to, they, they want one, one foot in this world and one foot. You can't have it that way. You can't have it that way. They pass over, here's the thing. Some refuse to accept Christ and be saved because they, th there is pleasure in sin. And because they love their sin and they want their way. They pass over the delayed gratification uh, promised to the Christian. And there is gratification promised. Yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. He begins that portion by saying, but you have need of patience. That after you've done the will of God, you might receive the reward. And you might receive the promise, right? It's after. It's later. We get things here, and God is good to us here, and we're good to each other, and God helps us. And oh my, and I'm looking forward to next Sunday when the church is back together, Lord willing, and and I'm trusting in that, and I'm looking forward to that, and I'm longing, my heart longs to see you. And there's that. But what we have to look forward to is in the future, and it's going to be heavenly, and it's going to be divine. And they pass over the delayed gratification promised to the Christian in favor of the immediate, uh, though temporary, gratification of the world. For this cause, when the end comes, their gratification also ends and their torment begins. And by the way, lasts forever. 
What was it Abraham said to the rich man in Luke 16, 25? Remember? He said, son, remember. He said, son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now. There, that was then, this is now. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And let me tell you this, and the rich man testifies of this, no amount of good back then can make up for what they're going to experience in the end. What doth it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Two times in Psalms, once in 14.1 and once in 53.1, the psalmist says, The fool had said in his heart, There is no God. And the reason is given in the rest of the verse. Why does the fool say there is no God? I present to you that it's out of convenience. Here's what I mean. He goes on to say, they are corrupt. They have done abominable things. There is none that doeth good. Here's the thing. The truth revealed here is that the cause of them rejecting God is their love for their sin. You know, when a sinner is living in sin, it's very, very uncomfortable and inconvenient to believe there is a God to whom he's going to answer. It's easier just to di dismiss the idea, to rub it off the table, to brush it aside. He has no intention of giving up his sin. He's in love with it. He's uh, joined to it, and he doesn't want to give it up. And the idea of God rakes on him and it grieves him and it, it interferes with the fun that he's having and the pleasure he's enjoying in his sin. It interferes with it. Ask me how I know it. He says it's because that they have pleasure in unrighteousness. And as a result, and it's eye-opening and it's heart-wrenching, as a result, he says that all they who receive not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness, are damned. They are condemned. They are them that perish. The present conflict, the prophetic climax, the practical conclusion. Paul has spoken to us of the mystery of iniquity. That ongoing work of Satan that had its origins back in the Garden of Eden, uh, so far as man is concerned, uh, where the serpent beguiled Eve and sin entered into the world. Since that time, the mystery of iniquity has been at work. While every person has been given a free will by God, the ability to choose whom we will serve, there are spiritual forces outside natural human perception that are vying for our allegiance. On the one hand, we have the love of God that pleads with us to be saved through Christ. It's the truth in love. And on the other hand, there's the lie of the devil that seeks to prevent man from being saved by appealing to his natural tendency towards sin. Solomon reminds us that there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Uh, the devil offers cheap pleasure. He offers cheap pleasure through worldliness and sin. What he doesn't tell you is that it lasts only for a season that it ends in death and eternal torment and separation from God. Jesus Christ offers salvation. He offers forgiveness of sins. He offers newness of life. He offers to lift that burden and he offers the eternal joy of the Lord. I made my choice. I made my choice back on April the 2nd of 1996 when at my grandpa's funeral I bowed my heart, bowed my head, bowed my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And asked God, I just called on him and I said, Lord, this preacher says you'll save me if I call on you. Well, I'm calling on you. And you know what happened? God saved me. God saved me and he'll do the same thing for you. I trusted in Jesus Christ and true to his word, God saved me. Many of you have made your choice for Christ. At some point in your life, you bowed your heart, you bowed your head, you became aware of your need. That was that uh, outside force of God working on you. The mystery of iniquity had been at work on you trying to keep you out and God broke through. It can't keep God out and the light of Christ shone in and you heard preaching or you read a gospel tract or somebody was witnessing to you 
Uh, you were in a church service, something God spoke to your heart, began to draw you to himself. And you said, yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. You said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You said some words kindred to these, or maybe you kept your mouth uh, closed and silently in your heart. You cried out to God, but God heard you. God heard you and he saved you. Many of you have made your choice for Christ. God is no doubt dealing with some of you who are listening to this right now. You've never come to Jesus. You've never trusted Him. Oh, you've heard of Him. You believe He exists. But you've never entered into a relationship with Him. You've never identified Him as your Lord. You've never claimed Him as your own and gave yourself to Him. Though I may not know you, I've prayed for you. In the preparation of this message, I took time to pray, Lord, all those that hear this message, would you speak to their hearts? Would you draw them to Jesus Christ? Would you save them? And I know that's the will of God because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Friend, if God is speaking to your heart, will you trust him today? Will you trust him? Will you listen to that voice? Will you block out everything and just say, at this moment in time, just say, yes, Lord, yes. I submit, I surrender, save me. Would you do that? God will save you if you'll only ask him. For the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Don't let this moment slip. Don't let it pass. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. And if you give it any amount of time, something's going to come in. An unseen force is going to come in and try to distract you and lead you away and make you... Uh, think about other things and busyness is going to come in and life is going to happen. Don't put it off, friend. Now's the time. Now's the day of salvation. This is the acceptable time. Would you bow your head now and cry out to God for mercy? And you have his word. He'll give it to you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, so much. I pray again for these who've heard the gospel preached but don't know Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that right now would be the moment that you would use this message. My feeble words, oh God, my feeble attempt at preaching your word, but Holy Spirit, use it. It's the word of God. Captivate them. Draw them to Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you for giving us this revelation in your word, the present conflict that's going on in our world, the prophetic climax that's coming and the practical conclusion. Them that perish, Lord, that phrase has stuck in my mind. Oh God, I pray. I pray, oh God, that you would revive your church and give us an ever-increasing desire to fulfill the great commission and getting the gospel to every creature, preaching the gospel to every creature. More and more people might have the opportunity to trust Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen. Church, I love you. Look forward to seeing you next Sunday. God bless you. When peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It Try.